<laughs> so I'm Andre, um, been part of the Ruby community for about three years now, so time's really getting on. Um, I work at a two-man, uh, two-person uh, company. <laughs> uh, we do Rails, Ruby, and also Angular, and uh, we build open source um, accounting software. So here's a little overview of um, what I'm going to talk about in uh, the next section. So I've got two sections. Um, kind of uh, regressed the talk. Um, it was supposed to have a whole heap of uh, advanced stuff in here, but just in terms of time and also um, in terms of uh, taking care of, I suppose, all the beginners and stuff and um, talking about my journey, um, I thought I'd start with more the beginner side and kind of move it up. Um, so sorry anyone who was looking forward to the more advanced stuff, um, I'll be putting that into the next talk. So yeah, I'm going to look at, um, yeah, so why talk about Git, um, also sculpturing your Git commits, um, why write a Git story, um, like a change log, uh, creating features, just how to go about it, especially for the beginners. Um, it's something that took a bit of time for myself to get around, or head around. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just something to kind of always aim for if you're a beginner. And actually writing a story. So collaboration, um, coming back to collaboration, um, so collaborating when you cannot speak to anyone, that's quite a difficult thing. Um, especially uh, this happens in the open source environment. Um, I bring this up because uh, this is kind of like a more extreme example of coding in a team that I can think of. And um, it's much harder to work on a project uh, when you've never seen the code base before. Um, you've got no one to ask about the code. Uh, the documentation's there, but it's kind of got a lot of holes in it and there's a lot of open source projects that have got this, they're just starting out. Um, and also there might only be a few tests to kind of guide you. Um, but even if these things are there, um, it's just much easier to sit with someone and get them to tell you a story um, about how the code works. So how about the next best thing and reading the story for ourselves? So rewinding three years, uh, like I said, um, I was a fresh, brand new developer. Uh, there was a mountain of stuff to learn. Uh, and one of these things was Git. Um, and as you all know, you start out and you see this thing called Git and you just want to get your code in and uh, save it and move on. And um, Git's kind of was in the way uh, to start off with. Uh, but looking back now, I realise that even though it is one of the most hardest things to learn, um, it is definitely the most valuable. Um, and why is it hard? Well, the reason why I found it hard is I found it hard not because it's conceptually difficult to understand. I just found it hard because it's a workflow. And workflows are hard. Um, think about how long it takes to change your mindset into the Rails way of doing things. Um, the same is true for working in a workplace. When you're new to a workplace, it takes quite a while to get used to uh, all the procedures and the workflow. So software also in businesses usually moulds around the business and not the other way around um, because workflows are very difficult to change. Using Git and progressing towards like an advanced Git uh, workflow allows working with other developers easily, uh, especially on open source projects. So sculpturing your Git commits. Uh, Git allows us to alter the commit messages of those that are already being committed. Um, obviously, you can't do this if it's being pushed up to an upstream branch. Um, 
We can also rearrange the order of our commits. We can break up our commits, take little bits of code out, uh, and we can choose um, to separate these bits and make them into smaller commits or collect lots of smaller commits and squash them into one big commit. So with these tools, anything's really possible uh, in terms of you don't have to worry about making a mistake because uh, there's always a way to undo what you've done. Uh, so as a beginner, it's really nice to know that. And um, I think one of the hardest things as a beginner is that apprehension of making a mistake. Uh, but uh, hopefully tonight you can kind of see uh, a few tools uh, that you can use to uh, overcome those things. So why write a story with Git? Well, it kind of allows you to commit in sentences and that's what we've been trying to do at our workplace. It makes communicating between developers uh, easier. Um, we also try and use the Git log so that the Git log is almost like a collection of pros. So whenever we write a commit, we try and write it with keywords so that we can search these keywords later. Uh, and also, yeah, so it starts to read like a story and we've got that in our mind. Um, the git log is also great summary point uh, for a change log. Uh, so it all kind of builds up to a higher level and new starters or new uh, open source people um, can easily kind of delve into a project from starting from this higher level. Uh, but it kind of sounds like a lot of work to do this and sculpture all your commits and it is at, at the start, um, but as you kind of delve into it and the workflow becomes more natural, um, it actually can save you a lot of time. So the change log. So at Digitech, the company that I work at, um, we've found that once we have a nice Git log, we're able to summarize the changes to a higher level and make this into a super simple uh, change log. And we're also like working on that to automate that so that our change log uh, happens automatically, which would be really nice for our customers. But why do you need a change log? Well, a change log provides like a nice high level summary of all the features that you're working on in your code base. It also provides a great diagnostics tool for when problems arise and helps to hone in on a problem area by starting off at the higher level and then delving down through the Git log using tools like Git Bisect uh, to get down and find the actual problem area. So creating features, the need to break up work into the smallest possible standalone items um, is something that I really struggled with uh, as a beginner. Um, and it's something that really helps uh, in terms of this workflow. And Git flow, uh, pretty much most workflows, uh, you wanna work towards this uh, as, as a goal. Uh, and Git flow encourages regular sharing between, uh, a regular sharing of code between developers. So actually writing the story. The story is pretty much written in terms of rebasing your commits and uh, using the sculpturing your commits uh, via a rebase. So whenever something happens, like a problem happens, it's fine. Uh, you can usually rebase your way out of trouble um, or in very dire circumstances, you can use uh, Git bisect and recover anything that's been deleted. Okay, so the next section, I'm just gonna talk about communicating with Git. Um, and Git flow in more detail. So Git flow for the beginners uh, uses two branches uh, to record history. So I'll just go 
sure to the next bit. And it uses a master branch and a development branch. Um, you've got a dedicated release branch and many feature branches, at least one per developer that comes off uh, those uh, dev branches. So the aim is to push feature branches to dev as often as possible. Uh, this allows other developers to access your changes quickly. Uh, this reduces the amount of code that needs to be rebased, reducing conflicts. So uh, we do our utmost to only ever merge into the master branch from a release or a uh, tagged version uh, from the dev branch uh, if the release is ready. All additions into the dev branch are only from feature branches, uh, which are all, always rebases only. And um, the hotfix branch uh, is there for emergency pack patchwork uh, on the master or production uh, branch. Got my slides out of order. <laughs> All right, we'll just skip on to here. So, why bother with Git? Well, individuals with Git flow, individuals have a version of all branches. Um, they can pull in changes from upstream master or dev branch to update their local copies of these branches. Uh, they can deal with changes in their branch. Um, after all, who knows the code better than the person who wrote it? But there is a catch. What happens when you have multiple people working on a single part of the code base? Well, obviously you're gonna get merge conflicts, but we can just go over and talk to the person if we don't understand how to deal with a merge conflict, right? Well, suppose you're working in a different location, different country, or remotely. Then all we have to go on is just the code we have in front of us. Well, let's just read the code. Well, if the person Verbal, if a person verbally communicates an intention and the intention is still misconstrued by the other party, then it just shows that communication's hard. Uh, and this is verbally. And it's also one way. Well, it's one way if your feedback loop is very long. So if it's days or whatever, and if you're working on an open source project, um, this can be the case. So if communicating your intention verbally is really hard, then what about communicating in words or communicating via code? So obviously verbally words and then code is kind of the progression towards the hardest form of communication. So this is why we try and use well-worded uh, key, key words in our commits uh, with the aim of building a nice uh, Git log story. I didn't even realize it went back. <laughs> All right, so rebasing versus merging. Um, a merge creates an extra commit, which allows two separate branches to be combined at that point, uh, whereas rebasing places the changes in one branch on top of the other, allowing for a nice linear git commit history, which reads like a book. Uh, git flow still requires merging, but only to the master branches. Okay, so kind of got the hang of Git flow. Now what? Well, once you're comfortable with Git flow, it's a powerful way of developing code in a team environment. It allows an individual to pull changes from the upstream master or development branch and deal with conflicts in the safety of your own local branch. Uh, the procedure works by switching the remote branch, your local copy, and updating your version of the branch. Then you can switch back to your feature branch. This means that you'll be sitting in your feature branch. Uh, this is significant as it's important to know what branch you are in uh, when doing a rebase, and the, the rebase will place changes in that branch. The power of this workflow is the person who is rebasing is rebasing their changes onto other people's changes. They can abort the rebase at any time and return their untouched branch or return to their untouched branch. 
It also allows for changes to be dealt with by the person who has made the change. Gitflow also allows developers to share code without touching any official code. And that's it. Question. Have you ever? Whoa, that's loud. Have you ever had any uh, like random code lost when you're rebasing onto another branch or anything like that? Yeah, that's that's pretty much when it happens and. It happens quite often. Um, so it happened last week. And the reason why it happens can happen quite often is um, just not keeping track of what um, what branch you're sitting in. So I thought I was sitting in one branch, but I was sitting in like a dev branch. And then I've rebased. And I've rebased sitting in the dev branch, which means all my changes have been pushed up to dev when I really wanted to pull all the changes down from dev onto my own branch. So when that happens, there's a few things you can do. Um, you can move back down to uh, the, the particular branch and create a copy of the branch and then get rid of it all. Um, or you can use uh, reflog. Uh, how you going? I just want to talk about um, the pull requests. Yeah, so I'd using <laughs> actually GitHub or another tool like GitHub, where um, you actually can't push your code to master or dev, and you can only submit your code through a pull request. That will protect you from exactly what you just said. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, so in um, the discipline that that, uh, that I've had for the, for the last several years has been that. And it also provides code review as well. Um, and GitHub is a nice nice interface for that. So that's just one that I want to share with everybody. Yeah, that's and great. understanding the difference between merge and rebase is kind of important because there are differences that I'm not going to explain. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hey, Andre. Thanks for the great talk. Um, one of the... Watching your slides, I found that a lot of... What you're talking about with communication, communicating with Git, I found I could relate to very well um, due to my work with Bundler and Ruby Gems. One of the problems I have noticed, though, is how to communicate these kind of rules to people who are contributing. I'm just curious to wonder, have you developed any strategies or any kind of ways to kind of communicate on how to like structure your commits, how to like set keywords that are searchable uh, in a project or anything? Um, we've kind of done it organically, but we haven't really written a style guide. Um, but we've kind of worked out that it's really helpful to work to put in uh, the feature that you're working on, and yeah, really just the feature that you're working on. Um, that makes it a huge deal easier. If you've got the feature in every commit, um, that makes it easier to go back to. But um, I haven't actually put this anywhere. But the whole point, well, one of the points of the talk was to kind of um, talk about these tools because uh, I see these, uh, I see requests in open source quite often where people have gone to the trouble of creating some code. Uh, creating a pull request and um, the pull request contains maybe five, six, ten commits and the person who wants to review the pull request doesn't want to go through every single commit because sometimes, well, most of the time when we uh, develop code, we don't really develop it in a uniform way. We might do something and then go backwards and it kind of can be like an upward sawtooth. Uh, so by squashing all your commits together, you kind of get rid of that back and forth. Um, so that was one of the reasons for the talk is to just kind of identify that uh, or highlight that, um, yeah, kind of for open source. Thanks, Andre. Anybody else? Yep. 
before you mentioned um, communicating to each other um, for a voice, um, have you, you guys thought about um, communicating for email as well, to send each other emails saying to explain stuff, for example? Yeah, that's right. Um, it kind of gets a bit harder in terms of team sizes. Um, like at the moment, because there's only two of us uh, developing, it's really easy for us to talk. Um, but what has happened is uh, Michael is away because um, he has a baby. So we do, we've started to work remotely. Um, and emails are good, but I don't always check my emails. Um, it's a really powerful thing to be able to work uh, to a workflow. Um, I think that's one of the real powers of Rails um, is when you work with other people who know the Rails way, um, you can actually almost read each other's thoughts because you're all working in the same pattern. So I think that's the real power of, excuse me, learning a workflow and working in it. It just makes it really easy to work with anyone, whether it be at a Rails camp or whether it be uh, over the net uh, on an open source project or even just remotely. Thanks, Matt. Um, in the absence of a style guide, if you haven't got one, do you have any examples <laughs> of uh, maybe open source projects that we could have a look at where you've got good examples of this being done well? Yeah, it's a good question. I haven't actually put anything together. I have found some open source projects that do a good job, um, but I would have to push it out through the meetup. Um, Maybe you can tweet it. Or tweet it. I hardly ever tweet, so this could be a, a first <laughs> tweet for the year. <laughs> Anybody else? Cool. Cool. Uh, thank you, Andre. Thank you.